in this lecture, we shall begin by discussing litigation in respect of family property. Now, the issue of who has the requisite mandate to sue in respect of family property has arisen many a time in civil suits and in land litigation. Now, who is the proper person to sue and maintain an action in relation to family property or family land? Now, the general rule is that suit in respect of family property, an action that has been instituted to protect family property, such as land, the action must be instituted on behalf of or as representing the family. And the suit must be brought by the head of family. That is the general rule. So if there's family property or family land, the local standard or capacity to maintain such an action has been given to the head of family as a general rule. And so this general rule, which is deeply rooted in our customary law, has also been captured under our High Court Civil Procedure Rules 2004 CI 47, under 4, Rule 9, Sub Rule 2 of the CI 47. It says that the head of family, in accordance with customary law, may sue and be sued on behalf of or as representing the family. Under 4, Rule 9, Sub Rule 2 of the CI 47. The head of family, in accordance with customary law, may sue and be sued on behalf of or as representing the family. Now, it must be important to note that when the head of family sues in his representative capacity, assuming for and on behalf of the family, the rule is that the head of family must endorse on the face of the writ that he is suing in his representative capacity. So when you look at order two, rule four of the CI 47, it reads as follows, and I quote, order two, rule four of the CI 47, it says that before a writ is filed, it shall be endorsed A, where the plaintiff sues in a representative capacity with the statement of that capacity in which the plaintiff sues. Or B, where the defendant is sued in a representative capacity with the statement of the capacity in which the defendant is sued. So if the head of family is suing in a representative capacity, he must make sure that he complies with order two, rule four, sub rule one, which requires that if he is opening a waffle, he should write opening a waffle, suing in his representative capacity as the head of opening waffle, so so and so family. Uh -huh. So if you are the head of the family and your name is Kwame AJ, you have Kwame AJ, then beneath this you have suing as the head of family and suing in his representative capacity on behalf of so so and so family. So, so it is important for you to note that even though on that two, rule four, is requiring that when you are suing in your representative capacity, 
you must endorse that capacity on the root of summons. It must be clearly stated over there. So even though on the other four of the CI 47, we have been given the permission that any suit that will be brought by the family must be brought by the head of family. The head of family cannot just sue and write his name over there because it may create the impression that he is suing for his private land. And so if you are the head of family and you are bringing a suit for and on behalf of the family, you must make sure you comply with order 4 rule 9 of the CI 47 and order 2 rule 4. You must make sure that you bring the action in your representative capacity as the head of family and you must endorse that fact of your capacity and the rate of summons. So we know the rule under order 4, rule 9, sub rule 2, which reads that the head of family, in accordance with customary law, be sued and be sued on behalf of or as representing the family. And we have seen the requirement under order 2, rule 4, that the fact that the head of family is suing in a representative capacity must be endorsed on the face of the writ of summons. Now, what if the, a person institutes an action as, say, describing himself as a head of family and suing in his representative capacity as head of family? And that capacity is challenged. Who would have the burden of proving that the person who has instituted the action does not have the capacity to maintain an action on behalf of the family? Should it be the one who has sued? Should he be the one who have the burden to prove that he has capacity? Or it should be the one who is challenging? The answer to this question it's in the case of Nyameche versus Ansa. Nyameche versus Ansa. Nyameche is spelled N Y A M E K Y E versus Ansa. A N S A H. 1989 90. To Ghana Law Report at page 152. The court in this case noted that when a person brings an action, as head of family, in his representative capacity as head of family, and that capacity is challenged. It is the onus and the burden will be upon him. It will be upon he who has brought the action as representing the family. The onus and the burden will be on him to show that he has been duly authorized and the family to bring the action. This is what the court said in holding three, as captured in the head notes. The court held that, as a general rule, the head of a family, as a representative of the family, was the proper person to institute suits for the recovery of family land. And where the authority of a person to sue in a representative capacity was challenged, the onus was upon him to prove that he had been duly authorized. This is the case of Nyameche versus Ansa, 1989-92, Ghana Law Report at page 152. So when the head of family whose capacity has been challenged, when he introduces sufficient evidence to show that he's the head of family who has the right to bring the action, then the burden will now shift on the one who was challenging to bring evidence to show that the person who has instituted the action does not have capacity as head of family. And that is the case of Akufi versus Otenge. Akufi versus Otenge. Akufi is not A K R O F I versus Otenge. O T N O T E N G E. 1989-92 Ghana Law Report at page 245 that when the head of family whose capacity has been challenged 
introduces evidence to show that he's the head of family, the burden will shift upon the person who was denying to show that someone else is indeed the head of family. So we have seen so far that under customary law and also under order 4, nine of the CI 47, the head of family may sue and be sued on behalf of a particular family. And we have seen another two rule four, that when the head of family sues as representing a particular family, or if he sued as representing a particular family, that fact of his capacity, it must be endorsed on the face of the writ of summons. It must be endorsed on the face of the writ of summons. And then we have seen that when this capacity is challenged, the one who has sued is the one who must introduce evidence to show that he is indeed the head of family. So the question now is this. Apart from the head of family, is it possible for ordinary members of the family to institute actions on the behalf of the family? In other words, if the head of family is neglecting, and is refusing to maintain an action on behalf of the family. Can an ordinary member of the family bring an action to preserve the family property? And when that ordinary member brings the action and he is challenged, can the suit still stand? Because remember, that member of the family is not the head of family. So what we want to find out is that, apart from the head of family, who has been given the right under Order 409 of the CI 47, to institute suits on behalf of the family, can all nine members institute an action on behalf of the family? The answer to this question has been provided for in the case of Kwan versus Nieni. Kwan versus Nieni, Kwan is spelled K-W-A-N, N for nice, K-W-A-N versus Nieni. Nieni is spelled N-Y-E-N-Y-I-E-N-I. So Kwan, K-W-A-N versus Nieni, N-Y-I-E-N-I, and another, reported in 1959, Ghana Law Report at page 67. Now, what did the court hold in Kwan versus Nini? The court held that first, as a general rule, if you read holding one of the head notes, now remember this judgment in Kwan and Nini was delivered by Van Larry CG. Now, this is what the court held as far as capacity to maintain an action in family land is concerned. And I quote, as a general rule, the head of family, as the representative of the family, is the proper person to institute a suit for the recovery of family land. As a general rule, the head of family, as the representative of the family, is the proper person to institute a suit for the recovery of family land. Then the court goes ahead to say as follows, and I'm still quoting. To this general rule, there are exceptions in certain special circumstances, such as one, where family property is in danger of being lost to the family, and it is shown that the head, either out of personal interest or otherwise, will not make a move to save or preserve it. Or, I, I, where all owing to a division in the family, the head and some principal members will not take any steps. Or, I, 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 
where the head and the principal members are deliberately disposing of the family property in their personal interest to the detriment of the family as a whole. The court went ahead to note that in any of such special circumstances, the court will entertain an action by any member of the family, either upon proof that he has been authorized by other members of the family to sue, or upon proof of necessity, provided that the court is satisfied that the action is instituted in order to preserve the family character of the property. So the court in Kwan and Yeni has recognized that the head of family is the appropriate person to sue and be sued as representing the family in respect of family property. The court recognizes that the head is the one that has capacity. But the court is further noting that there are some exceptions. One, where family property is in danger of being lost to the family. And it is shown that the head, either out of personal interest or otherwise, will not make a move to save or preserve it. Then this is one of the grounds under which any member of the family can bring an action upon proof that he has been authorized by other members of the family to sue or upon proof that there is a the necessity for him to sue to preserve the family character of the property. The second exception is where, owing to a division in the family, the head and some of the principal members will not take any steps to bring the action on behalf of the family. Or, thirdly, where the head and the principal members are deliberately disposing of the family property in their personal interests to the detriment of the family as a whole. So, Kwan and Yeni has given us exceptions to the rule, said that if you prove any of these, or you can prove that there's necessity, then the courts may entertain an action by an online member of the family to preserve the family property. So when the ordinary, the member of the family, so take note, the mere satisfaction of any of the three things itemized under Kwan and Yeni will not be enough. If you prove any of such special circumstances that maybe the head of family, they are one tonally dissipating family property, if you prove that one, the court will only entertain your action if the member bringing the action can show that he has the authority of other members of the family to sue. Or if you can show that there is a necessity that he has to bring the action to preserve family property. Now, you remember we noted that under Order 4, Rule 9, it has been stated that the head of family may sue and be sued on behalf of or as representing the family. And we have also mentioned that according to the case law, now we have been told that there are some exceptions outlined in Kwan and Yini that can allow ordinary members of the family to bring an action on behalf of the family. Now, it will interest you to note that even though the CI-47 says that it is the head that may sue and be sued on behalf of the family, the CI-47 even contemplates that there are instances whereby ordinary members of the family will bring an action to preserve family property. And this is under Order 4, Rule 9, Sub Rule 3 of the CI-47. It says that, and I quote, if for any reason, if for any good reason the head of family is unable to act, or if the head of family refuses or fails to take action to protect 
the interest of the family, any member of the family may subject may subject to this rule. Sue on behalf of the family. So even the CI forty seven, which is the rules governing the High Court in Ghana, contemplates that if the head refuses or fails to act, any member of the family may subject to this rule sue on behalf of the family. But of course, the rule also requires that when any member sues, he has to serve a copy of the writ on the head of family. Family, well, the head of family will know that because he has failed to act, an ordinary member has taken steps to preserve family property. So it is important to note that it's not only the head of family who can sue in relation to family land. Ordinary members can sue if they can come under their sessions in Kwan and Yeni, and also if they can come under order 409 of the CI 47. Now, now that we have identified that it is the head of family that has capacity to sue in relation to family land, how we appoint a head of family is very important because we, it, is, it is the person who has been properly appointed as the head of family. He is the one who can sue in relation to family land. So our next discussion is to find out how do we appoint a head of family? How do we appoint a head of family? Now, in the case of Welbeck and Captain, Welbeck and Captain is spelled W E L B E C K versus Captain, C A P T A N, 1956, to West African Law Report at page 47. The court in that case held that the head of family is appointed by the principal members of the family, by the principal members of the family. And so what it means is that if you want to appoint a head of family, you cannot go and organize a meeting where just anybody at all is going to vote by show of hands or by writing something, and you will say that you have appointed a head of family. The law has designated the particular people who must participate in the appointment of the head of family. And that it must be the principal members. So in every family, you must know who the principal members are. And they are the ones who can appoint the head of family. So you cannot go and appoint head of family by just anybody at all in the family. You organize a party and then you show your hands or you write, no, 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 you can't appoint like that. It must be the principal members. That is what Welbeck and Captain is saying. Now, if you read the case of Latte versus Mensa, 1958, three West African law reports are paid 410. Latte versus Mensa. Latte versus Mensa gives an indication that the appointment of the head of family must be made by all the principal members of the family, all of them. It gives an indication that the appointment of the head of family must be made by all of the principal members of the head of family. It's the same Latte and Mensa lays down the position that the meeting at which the appointment of the head of family is going to be done, that meeting where we are going to appoint the head of family, that meeting must be conveyed specifically and solely for the purpose of appointing the head. And notice to that effect must be given to all the principal members. Latte versus Mensa. Latte versus Mensa is telling you that one, the appointment of the head of family must be done by all the principal members. And not only that, that the meeting at which you are going to appoint that head of family, that meeting must be conveyed specifically and solely for the purpose of appointing the head. And notice of that effect must be given to all the principal members. And so if you go and you have a party 
where people are making merry and you go and take a microphone and you say, today we are happy, let's appoint our head of family, then you bring one person out and you vote for that person. Latte and Mensa is saying that it is wrongful to do that and that you cannot do that. Because Latte and Mensa is saying that the appointment of the head of family has been done at the meeting, conveyed specifically and solely for the purpose of appointing the head. And notice of that meeting and the purpose must be given to all the principal members. Latte versus Mensa. Latte versus Mensa had added up to Warbeck and Captain. Because Warbeck and Captain says the appointment must be done by the principal members. And now Latte and Mensa is saying that you must appoint him at a meeting conveyed specifically and solely for the purpose of appointing the head of family. Latte versus Mensa goes ahead to lay down the position that where some principal members are giving notice of the meeting and then they absent themselves from the meeting, the appointment that has been done in their absence, it shall be binding on all the absentees. On all the absentees. Again, Latte and Mesa lays down the position that while some of the principal members are not notified that upon proof of such failure of notification, then such members may then move to have the decision set aside. So Latin Mensa is saying that if you fail to notify some principal members, then when they are able to prove that they were not notified, then the decision taken may be set aside. But remember, it has already laid down that if some members have been duly notified and they have sent themselves, whatever decision is taken will be binding on them. Latte and Mensa. Latte and Mensa. And then we come to the case of Anka versus Alodi. Anka and Alodi say that. to appoint a head for the whole family. But when there's a division in the family, one faction cannot go ahead and appoint a head for the whole family. Now, the next case to look at is Banahini versus Edinkra. Banahini is spelled B-A-N-A-H-E-N-E -E versus Edinkra, A-D-I-N-K-R-A-H. Reported in 1976, one Ghana law report at page 346. This case lays down a very interesting position. It tells us that strangers or people who are not members of the family, they can be invited to the meeting as observers, as observers. And they may even participate in the deliberations. But Emphasis on the but, but such strangers and non-members, they cannot take part in the decision to appoint the head of family. So Banahini and Edinkra is saying that strangers can be appointed, can be nominated, can be can be invited as observers, and they can even participate in the deliberation, but they cannot take part in the decision to appoint the head of family. Banahini. Versus Edinburgh, 1976, one Ghana law report at page 346. Some people usually think that once a person dies, then, oh, they are the oldest person. Then head of family, it goes to a particular person as of right. It is not true. When you read the case of Heavy versus Tamaku, Heavy versus Tamaku, it tells you that the head of family, the appointment of a head of family, it is, not, it is neither automatic, nor does it, nor, nor, nor does it devolve, devolve on the person as a right or as of entitlement. 
Nobody can say he's entitled to be appointed as a head of family. Look at heavy and tamaku. Heavy spells H-E-L-V-I-E -E versus tamaku. Tamaku is called T-A-M-A-K-L-O-E and others. 1958, three West African law reports at page 342. That the case lays down that under native law and under native custom, a person does not automatically become head of family out of rights. He must be either appointed or elected by the principal members of the family when the post becomes vacant. So you cannot say that you are as of rights, you are the head. No, 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 no. The principal members are the ones who must appoint the head of family. Now that we have dealt with the appointment of the head of family, how can that head of family be removed? Now, the principle has been stated in the case of quail grain versus edu. Quail grain versus edu. Quail grain is spelled Q-U-A-G-R-A-I-N-E versus edu, E-D-U. Reported in 1966, Ghana law reports are paid 406. At a day, as he then was. Also, in the case of Abaka versus Ampredu, Abaka is called A B A K A B A K A versus Ampredu, A A M B R A D U, 1963, one Ghana law report at 456. It says that the decision to remove the head of family must be taken at a family meeting, and the principal members must be invited to attend. That meeting, Abaka and Ambredu further lays down that the head of family must be served with the notice to attend the meeting. He must be served with the notice to attend the meeting, but the purpose of the meeting need not be stated in the notice. And where the head fails to attend without good reason, the meeting may proceed and he could be removed in absentia. That is Abraka versus Ambredu. And you must note that once the family has taken a decision to remove the head of family, the court will not interfere with that decision to remove the head of family. Abraka and Ambredu is very important because once the head has been served with a notice to attend the meeting, when he fails to attend without good reason, they can go ahead and the principal members can go ahead and remove him from office. And the court will not interfere with that decision to remove the head of family from office. Finally, finally, there's this old position of the law that relates to the accountability of the head of family. The old position is that Hada has been, is, is that Members of the family cannot call upon the head of family to account. In other words, you cannot bring an action against the head of family in the court to compel the head of family to account. That is the old law. And this old law has been captured in cases like Finn and Gardner. Finn is called F-Y-N-N versus Gardner. G-A-R-D-I-N-E-R. 1953-14 West African Court of Appeals. This is what was said in that case. The members of the family cannot call upon the head of family for an account for their remedy. Their remedy is to depose him and appoint another person in his stead. This same position that the head of family cannot be called upon to account has been affirmed in another case of Abude versus Onano. Abude is spelled A-B-U-D-E versus Onano, O-N-A-N-O. -N -N this same decision was followed and adopted in Hansen versus Ankara. Hansen is spelled H-A-N-S-E-N versus Ankara, A-N-K-L-A-H, 1987-88, one Ghana law report at page 639. The old and on the position 
that you cannot bring an action against the head of family to compel him to account, to account. But this position has been changed under the New Lands Act of 2020, Act 1036, Section 13, Section 13, Subsection 2, lays down the Lord, and I quote as follows. A chief, Tindana, clan, clan head, family head, or any other authority in charge of the management of two or skin or clan or family land is a fiduciary charged with the obligation to discharge the management for the benefit of stool or skin or clan or family concerned and is accountable as a fiduciary. And then it says that under section 13, subsection 5, that the provisions of the Head of Family Accountability Act, 1985, PNDC Law 114, that act shall apply to the Land Act with the necessary modifications. It means that today, that act that was passed, the Head of Family Accountability Law, 1985, that act was an act that allowed an action to be brought against the head of family. It's saying that act will continue to apply. It means that the law we saw in Abude and Monano, the law we saw in Finn and Gardner, the law we saw in Hansen and Ankara, all of which made it impossible to bring an action against the head of family to account, these laws have been rendered as bad law because now the Head of Family Accountability Law 1985, PNDC Law 114, as well as Section 13 of the Land Act of 2020 and 1034, they make it possible for actions to be brought against the Head of Family to compel him to account. But you must note that even though permission is given to bring an action against the Head of Family for him to account, Section 13, Section 6 has some interesting provisions applicable when you want to bring the action against the occupant of the stool or skin to account. But remember that under our Lands Act, we recognize the Head of Family Accountability Act that today you can bring an action against the Head of Family to compel him to account. So this is where we will end our lecture. We have seen how we can appoint the head of family. We have seen also how we can remove the head of family. We have also seen how you can bring an action against the head of family to compel him to account. This is where we'll end our lecture on this particular topic. Thank you.